We're here today on Gadigal, Gadigal Country. I'm Alex Bainbridge from Greenft, and I'm here with Peter Boyle from the Socialist Alliance. Uh, it's very clear we're in a extreme housing crisis at the moment, uh, the worst in generations. And uh, a lot of people are scratching scratching around trying to work out well what is it, what is the source of this problem, and, and more importantly, how can we solve it? I mean, clearly, it is the case that uh, the the governments and the politicians are not taking enough action. And so we've started to see some examples of politicians and media pundits actually starting to you know, blame migrants and look for other sort of false solutions. Could we start off by talking about what's your response to that? Yeah, I think this was uh, particularly clear in uh, opposition leader Peter Dutton's uh, budget response. He basically straight out blame, blame, blame uh, recent migrants for the housing crisis and uh, almost uh, on cue, there was this, there was this like uh, right-wing demonstration held in in Melbourne soon after, uh, with uh, you know these neo-Nazis doing <laughs> Sieg Heils and 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 their big banner basically was focused on blaming uh, migrants for for the housing crisis. But I think this is and, and you know to be fair, it, it wasn't just Peter Dutton who said it. Um, there were numerous uh, newspaper, mainstream newspaper articles uh, in, the, in the period before which really headlined uh, migrants as to blame for the housing crisis. But I think this is really untrue. It's not to say that uh, the recent bounce back in migrant numbers after the COVID period where numbers fell and you know, the public people left the country um, has some impact. But clearly the housing crisis predates all this. People have been, Australia has been notorious uh, for having you know, a house price inflation and the gap between uh, the earnings of, of, of ordinary people and the price of houses has been growing, growing and growing, you know, I would say for decades now. So the problem clearly predates it in time. Um, now, the, the migrants are new migrants, as is normally the case, are coming to where the jobs are and they're moving to the big cities. So if migrants were completely to blame for this housing crisis, you would expect the crisis to be only in, say, Sydney, Melbourne or wherever, you know, the bigger cities. But the crisis extends way beyond it. Uh, some of the most uh, uh, extreme cases are actually in regional towns where uh, people just can't find places to stay. They can't even get into the caravan parks, which is a traditional last resort, you know, if you can't get into a house or a flat. They're full. Um, so the problem is clearly can't be sheeted down uh, to, to, to migrants. Uh, it's a problem that's been building for uh, a long while. And I would argue yeah, it's, it's a chronic problem and it's becoming clearer and clearer to people that this is a problem that's not temporary and is to do with the system itself. And people are finding it, uh, you know, the, the, the idea of like home ownership, you know, it's a quite powerful one. Uh, but in reality, the new generation of working class people, you know, cannot really hope to own their own home unless they inherit or they're prepared to get themselves to impossible levels of debt. So the dream, you know, is, is being crushed. Uh, an entire generation now finds itself like not only, you know, no hope of ever owning your own home, but they can't even afford to, to get together the rents uh, to, to, to rent a house or, or a flat to stay. Because now we have, you know, a, a, a rent, rent spiral as well. And they're shooting at, at ridiculous levels, you know. I think the average is about 23% in the last year, uh, say in a place like Sydney. But of course, averages cover up, cover up a lot. You know, people, people are being hit with requests for uh, a couple of hundred dollars a week increase in rent. I mean, ridiculous things. And so whole swathes of people now are, are, are being knocked out. I think there's one other excuse that's being put forward. And they say that during COVID, uh, Lots of people decided to that they don't want to go in big share houses, you know, uh, and 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 that this is one contributing factor. I'm, no doubt it might be a contributing factor, but once again, you know, this is a fairly short-term thing. It's fairly recent 
and I'm sure <laughs> the impact of higher rents uh, forcing people to make decisions about how they live. Um, in fact, we've had some reports that one consequence of this pressure is that uh, people who might be in abusive relationships you know, have to defer the decision to get out for financial reasons. They can't afford to, to rent on their own. So I, I'm sure this is part of the story, but uh, they're really trying to get away from the real problem. And I think the real problem has come about because housing is now functioning as just another commodity and not, and, 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 and the consequence of this is it's been taken further and further away uh, from being something that people need. The one section, small section of the population uh, sees housing as just another way to invest their capital. And, uh, and of course, if you invest your capital in housing, you want that capital to grow. So they have a very powerful interest in house inflation. Uh, and uh, governments are basically helping them along. They're helping that small section of the population that looks at the houses they own, not as somewhere to live, but something to make money from, to make a profit from, uh, they're helping them along uh, with all sorts of measures. Sometimes these measures are presented to the public as a way to help, you know, uh, new home buyers. You know, so they, they will cut the, cut the tax, the stamp duty on it, or they will offer some sort of uh, subsidy. But all this does in the end is it feeds into the price that is being asked for the, for, 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 for the houses. Uh, so it's actually helping the, the process along. Another notorious way in which governments are doing this is to negative gearing. You know, I think it, it, it's, it's basically a landlord subsidy. And the scale of it is, is, is quite incredible. I think it was like nearly $9 billion last year and according to the Parliamentary um, uh, Statistics Office, uh, Parliamentary, what's it called, PBO, uh, within the decade, this will rise to uh, a cost of uh, $20 billion a year. So this is more than the estimated uh, subsidy to fossil fuels. <laughs> it's incredible. It's on, 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 on the same level. Um, so when this happens, when you have house prices no longer, you know, having any sane relationship to what ordinary people can afford, but rather actually satisfying uh, the, the, uh, uh, the needs of, of capitalist landlords, uh, all the distortions of the system start to feed into housing inflation. And I think one thing which you never hear the mainstream media speak about is the is, is, is the way in which capitalists can choose uh, to use, put their capital into housing at moments when they're not prepared to take a risk on investing it into more productive uh, investments in manufacturing, for instance. You know? So typically, capitalism goes through this uh, regular cycle of overproduction. It, it just can't sell all the stuff it produces. And uh, in that situation, the people who have a lot of capital have to find somewhere to park their money. Now, there are numerous things, you know, uh, notoriously they've used to park their money. Many speculative things, banking, that caused the great financial crisis. Uh, but one of the places to park your money is in housing and in land. They call it land banking. Uh, arguably, it's become even uh, more attractive to, to, to capitalists because uh, uh, since the great financial crisis because you know, they're a little bit worried about putting their money into, in, into banks and, and other financial institutions. So I think this is a real factor. Uh, we saw it um, increase uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic, the height of the COVID pandemic, uh, because you know, capitalists were even more, you know, more reluctant to take the risk then and they sought to park their money. Uh, and uh, this extended into the regional areas because having, you know, uh, and, and it, it, it was a very dramatic rise in, in house prices in regional areas. We previously had been a lot cheaper than capital cities. So once again, it bears no relationship uh, 
to the actual numbers of people. You know, there has never been, there's been no uh, big shift of people to the countryside uh, uh, that, that could be used as the reason for why those prices have gone up. It's because capital has gone there for its own purposes, nothing to do with, uh, with satisfying people. And now another thing which I think has been contributing to the increasing cost of housing has been the, the uh, decision of Labour and Liberal state and fed, uh, state governments all around the country to go on a process of running down and privatising public housing. Now, these, these moves are normally sold as, you know, a clever way to free up more money uh, for public housing through some sort of public-private partnership, you know, to release the capital and land, etc., etc. But inevitably, all it's doing is actually further feeding the desire of big land developers, uh, building companies, and, you know, capitalist speculators in house inflation, because it's just giving them more stuff to speculate with. So I think, you know, this is never mentioned as one of the causes of the housing crisis, but I think undoubtedly it is. Uh, they've massively been uh, feeding it uh, through the privatization and the running down of, of public housing. So if the problems are resulting from commodification and uh, you know, capitalist investment in housing and running down public housing, what do you think are the real solutions to the problem? Well, interestingly, you know, I think many of the solutions, you know, are, they don't have to be invented. They're not new. Precisely because this has happened many times before uh, in the capitalist system. It's got to the point that, you know, the, the uh, housing has become so expensive in many cities around the world uh, that the capitalists are having a problem because they, you know, there's nowhere for their workers to stay. The workers who uh, who they need to do the work, they need to exploit in order to make money, and, and it becomes a problem. So it's, it's happened before. So for instance, uh, many cities around Europe uh, have had to impose at various times before strict rent controls. And in some cases, some of these rent controls have survived many decades. They still exist today. The entire parts of, of various cities where rents are under control. Uh, another thing which actually you could say, public housing was invented to try and address this solution. I think fundamentally it's still the biggest solution. The biggest solution because actually it liberates housing from the market. It liberates housing from being treated as a commodity. And in some countries, the level of public housing is quite high. In the Netherlands, for instance, it's uh, nearly 30% of all housing stock is in some form of public or social housing. Now, just as a comparison, the, that percentage in Australia currently is just 3.8%. 3.8%, and that includes not just public housing, public housing and, you know, it includes public and social housing. And unfortunately, uh, increasingly, uh, is being shifted away from public housing. So I think from that 3.8%, perhaps um, only 68% of that actually is now public housing. In other countries that beyond Netherlands, it's also much higher. I think it's about 24% in, in a whole bunch of European countries, uh, in, in, including uh, Scotland and you know, some of the Scandinavian countries. You know, so Australia is really way, way down. Uh, and I think fundamentally, you know, this is the big solution. Uh, you've got to actually liberate more housing, you know, away from the market so that it can actually address the, the basic need there is for people to have homes. Um, so I think that is correctly the sort of policies that uh, the Socialist Alliance puts forward and, and actually the Greens putting forward very, very strongly now. Uh, in comparison, what the, the federal Labour government is proposing is just completely ridiculous. You know, they're proposing a minor investment into a future fund. Yes, fundamentally, an investment into a fund that will speculate on the stock market. And then the proceeds of this tiny, a few million dollars, you know, like completely out of, 
all proportion to the problem that people are facing today, if it's earned, you know, and that's assuming the stock market doesn't crash and you know it goes backwards, uh, that goes into housing. So you know, I think it's it's absolutely uh, correct for the Greens and to to, to oppose it because this is rubbish. This, this is not addressing uh, addressing the, the problem uh, at, at all. Now, of course, they say you can't afford it, right? Well, I was going to say, how, how do you answer claims that, that yeah. public housing is too expensive? Yeah, I know. They, they say they can't afford it, but it, it, I mean, at the same time, you know, if, if they're going to spend, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars on nuclear, by acquiring nuclear powered submarines uh, on the stage three tax cuts, you know, I don't think that's, a, you know, that's, that, that's an, an argument that, that really flies. Um, I think another thing which to me is very interesting is that, um, you know, it's not just, you know, it, a, a push towards building public housing does not have to only solve the problem of housing, important as it is. Today, because of the climate emergency, it is a huge opportunity to make a massive step towards having a more ecologically sustainable society. Now, it's been calculated by a group called Beyond Zero Emissions that you could build a non-carbon emitting house in public housing for the, and a cost of around $275,000. And they were calculating on a relatively modest size campaign. You know? But if you had a really big campaign, undoubtedly there would be economies of scale. It might even be cheaper. And what you'd be doing here is not only creating uh, you know, housing to satisfy a huge real need in society, but at the same time, you would actually be uh, making a big step towards uh, you know, uh, addressing climate emergency. In addition to that, the households, you know, people who live in households that are you know, zero carbon emitting, of course, make a big saving on their energy bills. So on, on, on those levels, it makes sense. On top of that, it will create, you know, hundreds of thousands of jobs, and the calculations have been done. The number of jobs that could be created in a scheme like this, you know, make the 20,000 jobs that our Prime Minister Anthony Albanese is talking is going to come from the Orca submarine deal. You know, it's just that, that's just like spare change. You know, you, you literally could make hundreds of thousands of good jobs, of jobs that do good, but surely it's better than jobs that are going to build a, a, a nuclear submarine. So I think it's, um, that's, that's quite a powerful argument. I think there's one other question that, that that addresses. Precisely because we have had governments running down public housing, you know, not doing the maintenance, and public housing has been reduced from about a high point of about 7%, I think, in the early 1990s, to the 3.8% I mentioned earlier, and that's including social housing today. Um, part of this process is that what little public housing there is in Australia today has become really poor quality housing. It's, it, it's the most uh, uh, you know, marginalized sections of the community concentrated in bad quality, poor quality housing. And I would argue, you know, it doesn't have to be this way. Of course, if, if it continues like this, most people, most ordinary working class people, you know, the last thing they want to do is go into public housing because for them that's, the, you know, is a very, very poor option. But if we had public housing that was like leading the way in terms not only of eco being ecologically sustainable, but also good quality public housing. Uh, well, everybody would want to have public housing. So I think that's another thing that needs to be liberated. Public housing should not be seen as welfare housing. It's certainly not seen as welfare housing in many of these European countries where it's a bigger proportion. Uh, it should be seen as a great thing. You know, one of the housing be, options. Yeah, one, 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 you know, a, a, a real option. And in many ways, you could see this providing a lead uh, to housing everywhere else. Uh, because again, once again, economies of scale, 
uh, feed in everywhere, you know, all housing becomes. Now, the most immediate impact of liberating a bigger section of all housing from the private sector is it will start to actually put downward pressure on the price of, 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 of houses all over in the private sector as well. So that's going to help other people, you know, deal with their mortgages because they, well, frankly, precisely because the only chance of most working class people of buying a house today was to get into ridiculous debt. And they did so when, before the current, uh, you know, r rises in interest rates, uh, they're now facing a big problem. How, how the hell do we pay our debt, you know? And uh, yeah, so this is going gonna, is, is gonna to address that problem as well. So what do you think are the broader implications of this line of argument for, you know, for sectors of the economy beyond housing? Yeah, I think it's, it, it, it points the way towards trying to, trying to imagine a different way in which society could be run. You know. The problem with capitalism uh, is that what it thinks is its great strength. The all-knowing market that somehow makes all the decisions for us where society's resources should be put, that it, it is the best way that, 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 that we could possibly do things, is now proving itself to be completely false. Uh, what you have here is, you know, resources in society being allocated not to satisfy the needs of society as a whole, but to satisfy a small group of people. And the way this came about, you know, it wasn't anyone's great plan. But what's called the market is actually the allocation of resources on the basis of a thing you could describe as the law of value. Now, this is something that evolved through human society on the margins of human society initially for a long period of time. When people, had, uh, when people wanted to exchange two different kinds of things, they had to think, you know, how do we see what's a fair exchange? You know, how do you work out what's a fair exchange between, say, apples and eggs, uh, or uh, a, a chair and uh, a piece of clothing. And what evolved, you know, through many, many years of human society, of many human societies, is that the rough guide was, what is the average amount of human labor goes into the thing? And that's what makes two things equivalent. And that makes a lot of sense for the purpose of exchange. But if that same principle is then applied to everything in society and everything is treated as a commodity to buy and sell, of course you create a number of distortions. In the first instance, it values everything by this strict rule. And some of the things that, you know, if you, if you reflect on it, are quite startling about what happens when you do this, is that it values nature, and all the fruits of nature is zero. Oh, because, you know, how many, what human effort made that nature? None. So it's valued as zero. Now, today, we really can appreciate the devastating impact of this, the complete devastation of the, of, of the planet that human society actually depends on, you know, that, has, that we either work with or, you know, we risk the viability of our own, uh, our own civilization, our own society. The other thing it values in a peculiar way is human labor itself. So, you know, human labor is valued as how much labor it takes to reproduce it. And this is why, you know, this is paradox today. We keep having, you know, we're relentlessly bombarded with the sense that technology is changing for the better. We're getting more efficient at doing things. And yet we're being asked to work longer and longer hours. This is, a, this is crazy. It only works in the system where, you know, something has gone astray. Now there's a second order of this, is that because of this misallocation and of the systematic robbery of both nature and the people who do the work, we have a situation where a small group in society has accumulated more and more wealth and power. And it uses this wealth as capital. That is, it invests in to make more profit in the future. And what this means is that the driver now of all the allocations, the misallocations of society's resources, 
is actually how to make more profit. And where we get a situation now where the tiny group of people own way, way more than the huge majority collectively together, you can imagine the distortions we have. And I guess the, what's happening now with the climate emergency is the biggest example of this. You have two problems now, is that even though, you know, corporations, governments, they have meetings, they have summits, and they talk about, you know, how we're going to address climate change, at the same time, they can't help themselves. They still are going and digging up coal, they're still mining for oil and gas, and trying to flog it as much as they can. They're trying to get people to build uh, more and more, uh, you know, power stations etc. And they're pushing aside society's objections left, right and centre. And at the same time, they, they, they have this mantra, growth, growth, growth. You know, growth that's not necessarily sensible, you know, uh, growth that involves making stuff that we don't need, you know, nuclear weapons, for instance, but also a whole pile of other crap that's being forced down the throats that, are, that, 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 that fill the shops and fill the markets and glut the markets everywhere piles of packaging that all turn into waste, that destroy, you know, nature left right so that are actually completely uh, clogging up, you know, our rivers, the, 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 even the, the oceans, you know, are, are, are polluted. And all because they're driven by this profit mode. So this is, a, if you like, you know, a second level, a second degree consequence of society being uh, completely run on this on the basis of a market. So, you know, really, if we're going to survive this, this, this period, if we're going to survive the, the climate emergency, uh, we are, society as a whole is going to have to liberate itself uh, from you know, the, this market. Uh, and, and this is why, you know, when we talk about housing, and if we understand that there is a way to free up this, this part of society, you know, or this, this part of uh, society's resources, housing, from the market and convert it into a human right rather than a commodity. Well, you could imagine doing this with other parts of, of, of life, right? And, and actually, once again, this is not a new thing. Uh, we all have an experience with free primary public, you know, education, right? Now, most people don't think about it this way, but that's a section uh, that has been, that's something else that has partially been liberated from the market. All capitalists are fighting to take it back. They're trying to convince people that they'd be better off sending their children to private schools and they get governments to help them to do it. They have subsidies that, you know, subsidize, you know, these really, you know, expensive private schools, you know, they're getting more subsidies from the federal government than public schools are getting from the federal government. Uh, so there's always this struggle going on. But I think that's what the, the, the current discussion about the housing crisis and what the solutions are, you know, have, uh, have in it, you know, uh, the basis of imagining a different side, a sort of society, a different way of organizing, and that goes beyond the question of housing. It, 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 it intersects with the question of the environment, definitely, and it points uh, to other to solutions to other major social problems. Well, yeah, that's certainly true. I mean, we have a cost of living crisis, we've got the climate crisis, we've got the housing crisis. There are so many problems left, right and centre, um, and really system change is, is at the heart of the solution to all of those, and, and that's not going to happen without people power efforts to uh, to make it happen. So I'd like to thank you, Peter, for the time you spent with us today. Um, obviously, if you're watching this, like these sort of ideas that Peter is talking about, you might want to think about joining the Socialist Alliance. If you like videos like this, please uh, become a Green F supporter and we'll see you next time.